So world building is another kind of speculative futures approach. This is an image from the movie Minority Report, which is set around the time frame of 2050-ish. And to build the world, the filmmakers had to research what 2050-ish could be like. It wasn't just about looking into the technologies that could happen. It was also about diving into what political systems might be like. What are the ecological contexts? What are the cultural norms? And the film was so successful at grounding what at the time were really fringe areas of research. Responsive targeted advertising or touchscreen tech, like that wasn't around when it came out in the early 2000s, that it led to hundreds of patents in the years since because we could really see how these things might impact daily life. These days, some speculative features are designed to be experiential in digital form. This example is from Bidibon First Light, which is a VR exploration of a climate change Toronto by the First Nation artist Lisa Jackson. So as you put on these VR goggles, you explore what Toronto could be. It's hotter, it's wetter. And you also hear the languages of different First Nation people, the Wendat, the Ojibwe, the Mohawk, as you're moving through this world. So you're connecting to different aspects of its past, its present, as you are also exploring its future. Another approach is design fiction. These are typically ways of creating prototypes of tools that occur in a given scenario. What Sander showed us at the beginning is very much a design fiction. Another example that I love is called Ayapo Repository. And it's a 2016 effort by two artists, Ayota Molo Akusende and Salome Asega. And they made basically a museum and a resource library of objects that affirm the futures of black people. So they got together with some different community members. They brainstormed what some of these objects might be that can support black life in coming years. And then they made them into objects, so very much from like the Afrofuturism tradition of doing this work. Another speculative futures tactic is speculative design which is basically a forum for using design to challenge assumptions about current conditions and convention. This particular project is Hyphen Lab's neurospeculative Afrofeminism salon, which re-envisions a black hair salon as a lab for neurocosmetology and cognitive enhancement. So again, challenging the idea of what a black hair salon can be and doing it in high resolution fashion. Some speculative futures use more simple tactics. This is a project by the artist Candy Chang. She did a series after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in the mid-2000s, and she covered buildings that had been made vacant and abandoned after the storm occurred, and she covered them with these stickers asking people to add their ideas of what they wish those buildings were instead. And its simplicity gets to the heart of really what speculative futures are all about. They're a means of asking what if and why not. What else can exist here in place of what is right now? So the process of proactively engaging with the future in these personal, high-resolution, tactile ways is something that researchers find increases our resilience as individuals and as societies. The more we imagine what the future can be, the stronger our abilities to engage with longer timeframes become. The more we do that, the more we look into longer timeframes, the more frequently we end up challenging assumptions and current conventions. The more we challenge those assumptions, the more that our senses of autonomy and resilience start to expand, so doing this work can make us more resilient on individual levels. The more we imagine the future together, the more socially resilient we often become. Social resilience is essentially a different community's ability to adapt, cope, deal with different kinds of social and environmental hazards. And researchers are finding that just as important as ecological and infrastructural resilience is, social resilience is just as critical. This picture is an image of Chicago's 1995 heat wave, which killed hundreds of people across the city. And researchers have found in the decades since that communities that weathered the event more safely, where less people died, were those where people knew each other. They were socially resilient because they were socially connected. So while infrastructural resilience, for example, can take large amounts of time and money to achieve, Social resilience, our connections to each other, the institutions that hopefully support us, is a more immediate opportunity that still has very real impact. So researchers have found that stronger degrees of collaboration and reciprocity are an effective means of enhancing that aspect of social resilience. So collaboration is a way of deepening trust, and connection also lays the groundwork for self-determination, all of which can be very critical to enhancing resilience. So speculative futures tactics help us do this work, help us build these connections in a few different ways. One is by cultivating possibility through play. So one example of what this can look like is a project called the Republic of Columbus Bean. And it was an effort that was led by an artist named Jorge Manos Rubio while he was working in Columbus Bean, which is a neighborhood in West Amsterdam. 
So residents in the area come from a lot of different cultures, which has resulted in some conflict over the years. And after trying some more traditional measures to address these issues, local government asked different artists and designers to try some more experimental tactics. So Manos Rubio worked with residents in the area to come up with the idea of turning the local square into a micronation. So even though he was the one who came up with this initial concept, of creating a micronation, he used speculative futures tools to invite the wider community to inhabit it and explore what it meant to create this alternative reality in the moment. So they used speculative futures tactics to invite different members of the community into this process. They made their own money, passports, stamps, design fictions. They created a national space agency. They visited the actual European space agency, but they also came back to Columbus Bean, to the micronation of Columbus Bean, and used Tyvek kites to test out what their own future rocket launches could be. They created their own Olympic sports teams. So as the months progressed, the square became a sanctioned micronation acknowledged in Amsterdam, but also by other micronations worldwide. It was a place where residents could start to imagine that they were citizens of their own shared nation state and live out the ramifications of doing so in real time. So this was a kind of play. This was an experimentation. And it was also a way of stepping again temporarily out of the conflict zone that was this present state between people who had a lot of differences with each other. And it wasn't about ignoring the fact that those differences existed. It was about saying, what else can also exist here? And then creating a space to work through and have collaborative discussion about what else that could be and creating trust to different degrees in the process. This is not to say that this solved all of Columbus Bean's issues, because it did not. But it was, again, a way of cultivating new degrees of trust shared identity, and a certain sense of belonging. So speculative futures also invite us to not just think about the future, but to use our senses in order to feel it. And that can be a way of making the future feel like a really personal place. So this is a shot from a 2017 project called the Future Energy Lab, created by the studio Superflex for the government of the United Arab Emirates. Superflex created a series of interactive experiential futures installations with the goal of influencing the country's energy policies. So they identified five different energy scenarios that could occur in the country up to the year 2050. And they made an energy simulator, role-playing game, different interactive objects. So that different decision makers, the prime minister was involved, the head of cabinet, they could explore what these different energy futures would be, again, by feeling into and exploring in tactile ways what the ramifications could go down as. So in one scenario, people got to smell the air that might occur if current fossil fuel emissions rates continued. So it was a pretty noxious mix of carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, it smelled like rotten eggs. And it was an experience that allowed people to not just think about air quality in the future, but to really feel it, to experience it. I'm borrowing a phrase from Stuart Candy, who's a Long Now Fellow and a former colleague of mine, that Speculative futures, this work, helps us to not just see into the future, but feel into the future. And when we do so, we can start to really relate to the future as a fundamentally personal place, which it really is. We will be living, some of us at least, 30 years from now. Our children, our grandchildren will be living there. The speculative futures can also be a powerful way of balancing between the parts of our brain that work with long-term vision and other parts that are more focused on the here and now. Because speculative futures tools really focus on different narrative aspects, they can be a way of, again, linking the specific and the personal to initiate the balance between these two timeframes. frames.